What you doing? I'm attempting to view my work as a fleeting peripheral image as to engage the superior colliculus of my brain. So you're stuck. Why else would a person attempt to engage their superior colliculus? I usually just have coffee. Hi everyone, I'm Andy. Welcome to Furniture Fables. It doesn't take long in this furniture redesign biz to find yourself up against one of the most formidable of opponents. A good case of writer's block. Or in this case, flipper's stick. Flipper's stick is defined as an emotionally frustrating and artistically static condition experienced by the hobbyist or professional furniture flipper when it seems all good ideas have dried up, like the paint stuck in the bristles of your favorite brush that you forgot to wash out yet again. Self-doubt, blurred priorities, burnout, all of these can contribute to making the job of choosing what to do with our pieces seem like the most difficult part of the furniture redesign and flipping process. But don't despair, friends, for perhaps on the other side of that frustrating flipper's stick lies something powerfully rewarding. This friendly little mid-century modern styled coffee table came to me for free from a Facebook marketplace listing. It was originally sold on Wayfair, definitely not a vintage piece. Its previous owner explained that unfortunately they had somehow ended up using the wrong length of screw when mounting the top to the base and had blown through the veneer in those two places as you can see before they even noticed the problem. I considered attempting a simple faux wood paint repair, but I was concerned about blending a new top coat into that factory finish. And I had another plan that I was interested in trying, so I started to get her prepped. I mixed up a batch of White Lightning Cleaner by Dixie Bell and gave the table a good scrub down and rinse. Next, I mixed up a small batch of Bondo wood filler for those veneer holes and filled them in while holding the camera in one hand, which is not something I recommend unless you are an Olympic level Bondo filler. My inspiration for the tabletop was from these tables that had these beautiful inlaid wood pieces where the raw wood finishes were mixed in with painted or stained finishes in neutrals like blacks and creams. I used the very rudimentary photo editor on my phone to very roughly sketch out some ideas for my tabletop and then I started mapping out a design. Using a very old and very rusty right angle, I found the center and then made some marks and traced out a chevron or arrow shape. Then I taped that off on both ends and sanded down the veneer on the inside as well as those bondo spots. After that, I primed both of those two taped off sections. And when the primer had dried, I painted them with fusion mineral paint in raw silk. After I removed the tape, I stood back and looked at the top. Something about it was disconcerting, but I decided not to get bogged down in my doubts and just continue trudging forward. So I taped off some of that silk and added some fusion in the color coal black then revealed that addition. Then I got out a Dixie Belle silkscreen stencil and used some more coal black to add in that detail, then peeled back my stencil and was so struck by what I had created, I recorded my real-time reaction. What do you do when you realize 
the graphic you have made for the oval modern table you're working on looks like a football that a tiny mouse has driven a motorcycle across. <laughs> well, you start the fork over. Yes, indeed, friends. I had created a beautiful football <laughs> worthy of game day with a giant plate of nachos and cold beers and, well, I digress, but I did need to start over. It's true that someone with more patience could have possibly salvaged this design idea, but I was over it. I sanded back the paint and primer and tried to scuff sand off that factory finish as well, but I couldn't really keep from taking off a good portion of the original stain. So the first thing I did after sanding was tape off that outer edge of the table and then give it a good priming with Dixie Belle's Boss Primer in white. After the primer had dried, I still wasn't sure what I wanted to do with the top design-wise, but I knew that Fusion's Homestead Blue would be absolutely gorgeous against the original walnut wood tones that were still very visible on the table's edge and legs. So using a microfiber roller, I gave the table top two coats and let it dry for three hours. And then I got stuck. I looked at the table and looked and looked, but nothing came to me. No good ideas. I grabbed color after color, hoping that some inspiration would, would spring into my mind, but nothing. Not even weird combinations held up together could unlock this block. All I saw was a blank canvas. A deep and yawning chasm, a void with nothingness surrounding me on all sides. Well, that's a tad dramatic, but you get the point. Anyway, this is where fate stepped into this little fable. A few weeks earlier, I found myself in the garage of a local artist. I was there to pick up a bookcase that she and her husband no longer wanted. And as I looked around, I saw rows and rows of lengths of yarn dyed in all shades of a beautiful earthy rose. I couldn't contain my curiosity or <clears throat> nosiness and so I asked her about this setup and she explained that she was an artist who among other things made these wall hangings out of this dyed yarn. She got out a completed wall hanging and showed it to me and I was blown away. It was so beautiful. Everything she had was already sold. So as soon as I got home, I went on her Etsy shop and I purchased one. And wouldn't you know it, it arrived just in the nick of time. And as I opened it, I could feel my flipper stick melting away. Suddenly, a design idea began to take shape in my mind, and I knew what I wanted to do, and I knew which friends I would need to help me achieve my idea. I wanted to play off the linear element as well as the gradient color scheme of the wall hanging by creating a set of intersecting line groups along the tabletop. I would keep the lines on the table straight while the table shape itself could reference the curve in the wall hanging, while also hopefully creating a sort of suggestion to the observer that any curve or connection in these line groups was occurring off the table, so to speak. I was so excited about my new design direction that I made a short reel about it.
Next, I made three stripes in Twilight Geranium. Using that same painter's tape technique to space those lines out, I did three coats of Twilight Geranium and then removed that tape while the paint was still wet. The next step was to do two stripes of the lightest color. And so again, using that same technique, I spaced those stripes out two tape thicknesses away from that three stripe group. There you can see I'm adding that last long span of tape and removing the spacers. And then I painted those lines with a coat of peony. While that first coat of peony was drying, I started my final section of taping. This time I wanted to do three stripes, one in each of the three stripe colors I was using. I wanted this set of three to be set further out and a little more apart from the others that were more gathered around that right side of the table you can see there. I used the tape layering technique and ultimately added seven tape thicknesses along the two ends of those original stripes, thereby ensuring that this last set would be parallel to those lines. Once I had my seven layers, I laid down my first full length of tape and then used a shorter piece from above to mark off the thickness of the line that would eventually be painted. Then added the second full length of tape and then of course just repeated those steps again to create the other two lines. When you are using painter's tape, it is really important to make sure that you burnish really, really well, which basically just means that you press that tape down very, very thoroughly. And then once I had finished that, I pulled off all of the excess tape. Then I readied my three colors, each with their own brush and a piece of saran wrap so that I could wrap those brushes up as I went and I started adding my layers of color. While all of that was drying, I needed to address a little problem, missing wood buttons. This is a common occurrence in furniture like this. These little finishing buttons go missing all of the time. Luckily, you can easily order them or find them at your local stores in many sizes. This table needed half inch buttons. So I got out two of those and using my Verathane wood stain in walnut, I used a little artist brush to paint on some stain and then wiped back the excess and there were some perfectly gorgeous finishing buttons. They needed a few days to dry and then I went to glue them in but found that they were a tiny bit too tight. 
So I got out my little Dremel tool with its sanding attachment and I just very lightly sanded down a little bit of the inside of those screw holes. They fit great after that, so I added some wood glue to the inside as well as the edges of the buttons and then firmly taped them in while that glue dried. After I added a second coat, it was finally time to do my third and final coat on my stripes. So here I am carefully going around the table, adding in that third layer of my stripes, being super careful, paying attention to what I'm doing, being mindful. This is a really great thing to do when you are holding an open can of paint over your finished tabletop. You may sense some foreshadowing here. And then disaster struck. A huge glob of paint and it is of course crossing over my stripes oh okay so I want to share this with you because one it's important to know that I make mistakes all the time even silly ones like this and also here's how to manage something like a big paint spill onto a finished surface I grabbed my microfiber cloths. They are great in a situation like this and began to carefully blot up that paint. You can see that I am not wiping or rubbing at all. I'm just using the cloths to absorb as much of that paint as possible. After I had absorbed up the majority of the paint, I added a little water to a clean cloth and wiped up the remainder. You can see this got a lot of the paint up, but we will still need to do some touch-ups. So out come the little brushes to the rescue. <laughs> Using the smallest amount of paint as possible and a very light feathery touch, I blended the touch-ups into the original paint job. Okay, tape removal time. This is always really fun and really satisfying when you get to this point. Then I did a little bit of a wet sand to just kind of smooth out and butter up that surface. And then I did a little bit of focused sanding over those edges where the colors crisscrossed to create a bit of a softened kind of weathered appearance. You can see a little bit of that lighter color comes peeking through the darker color and I just thought that gave a really kind of cool effect. There were just a few tiny spots that needed little touch-ups. And then my assistant came in and wiped back the table with a tack cloth just to get any little bits of dust. She then followed me around as I applied the first of three layers of top coat. I am using Dixie Bell's Clear Coat in Flat. This is one of my favorites. It's true that Fusion Mineral Paint does not require a top coat, but for a coffee table, it's obviously a good idea to have those added layers of protection. By the way, Having an extra set of hands to 
wipe up those drips as you lay down. Top coat is so helpful on a tabletop like this one, which has really no barrier edge. I could just focus on doing a nice even coverage and keeping a wet edge while my awesome helper made sure to wipe back any excess or drips. All I can say is hooray for teamwork. Okay, do you remember our unwanted, wandering, wounded Wayfair table who got caught up in a case of flipper stick? And here she is now. Inspiration. It is all around us. Through a completely chance encounter and acquisition from a local artist, I was freed from the dreaded flipper stick. And I couldn't help but feel our little table here met up with some kind of magical kismet. Bold, graphic, and totally unique, this little gem was an unexpected addition to the local furniture listing sites. The proportioned asymmetrical lines reference the gradient shades in the wall hanging while they simultaneously contrasted its organic softness with their clean and still lines. The watery homestead blue base mixed with those neutral earthy rosy shades and in combination with the semi surfboard shape top gave off a distinctive vintage California surf culture vibe. This table, not for everyone, true, but something told me whomever it ended up with would truly love it. Okay, so number time. Well, let's talk the costs. The main cost, of course, was just mostly primer and paint. And if I add up everything, including my first failed attempt, it puts me right at about $25. Then if I add in a little bit more for sanding discs, that microfiber roller, uh, the stained finishing buttons, and some top coat, it would be safe to say my out-of-pocket cost was right at about $35. So what did I sell this masterpiece for? <laughs> well, a whopping $135, putting my earned income right at $100. I know, it's you're just blown away, right? Well, okay, so here's the thing. I might have said this before, for whatever reason, coffee tables are really hard to sell. At least that's what I have always found. And I knew this one was incredibly taste specific. And if I wanted to get a higher price, oh, I would have had to plan on holding onto it for quite some time. So I was okay with that price. Truth be told, if I had wanted to get top dollar for this piece, most likely a faux wood repair would have been the best way to go, but I just didn't want to do that. The thing is, only you know what you want to prioritize at any given time if you are taking on this craft as some level or type of business for yourself. But if you do find yourself with the space and the opportunity to try something new, to push yourself outside of your comfort zone, I highly recommend that you take it. Sure, I created a little case of flipper stick for myself, but when I finally experienced my inspiration, my work was truly joyful and I am glad that I did it. If you'd like to see more stories of artistic exploration and inspiration, please make sure to click that subscribe button, like and comment, and let me know what do you do to fight the flipper stick? Where do you find your inspiration? Thank you so much for joining me, my friends. I'll see you next time for more Furniture Fables.